how I got into winemaking, it's like a bit of a long story. Um, the long story is I was really into uh, farming, but not practically. Like I would study in grad school. I always was really interested in small farmers and subsistent farming and like those questions. And after grad school, I like had a bit of a mental burnout break and not burnout but just needed like a mental break and i started farming so i was like oh, i'm really into farming but i've never done farming myself other than like just a garden and i would spend all my time on my days off on this organic farm nearby where i was living and i just learned by doing and i loved it it was so incredible and it was uh we worked a lot with restaurants so i kind of got into hospitality a little bit so I would spend all my days off basically farming and then I was working uh, I was managing a restaurant and then through the restaurant I got into the sommelier side of wine and I did some like wine courses and then I was like okay I really like wine is really cool turns out like I would love to learn more about wine but in the same way I learned about um, farming like going and doing it so I just like called up some uh, agents that I was working with and I was like can I go do you know a winery that I could go and just like check it out and they're like yeah you should go to this winery um, nearby where I was living and I did the same thing I went out on all my days off and it was amazing it was really a magical time there as well there was like really a cool vibe of like they were kind of doing something different and a lot of psalms from like Toronto and Montreal would come and we'd have these huge dinners in the winery and that's also where I discovered natural wine like people no one in Canada really there's like a couple small producers were really making natural wine and um, people would just luckily like I, the people that would come to these dinners would have allocations that they would go to like New York and get and they were bringing these like incredible and like once you start drinking it you're like oh wow this is like a whole new world of wine it was so it was so it was just so different from what we were doing and um anyway so i ended up i would go there my days off they offered me a part-time summer job and i ended up just staying and at the end i was the assistant winemaker and i stayed there and i did harvest in south africa and 2015 and then when i i had kind of like reached the end of i was like i was really managing the cellar kind of by myself and I, and there wasn't room to make or experiment with natural wine and so I was like okay I'm gonna go do something else like I have to follow what I think is interesting here and I so I quit my job and I just sent out like emails to places in France that I liked and because of the um, Ganva's importer in Quebec he actually asked Anne like could I come for this like do work in the in the vineyards and that was in 2017 and it was supposed to be six months and I'm still here and it's five years later so that's how that happened. So this is, uh, I guess, a Pulsar Trousseau and now this is Pinot. Uh, we're getting into Pinot land. Uh, it was kind of also like a stars aligning and um, I had so, so kind of like after a few years of being here, I told Jean-Francois, like, I would kind of like to find some vines and start making wine. And also, I mean, it's difficult to, f it's not impossible to find land here. It's just, it's like, you know, you have to have, I think you have to be in the community and have contacts and stuff. It makes it easier. And, um, <laughs> and um, this plot so in 2019, there was a tiny, tiny plot of hybrids, which I still make. And Jean-Francois was like, hey, nobody wants this plot. And the guy is retired or he's too old to do it now. Like, do you want it's like tiny, tiny, tiny. So I told him, yeah, of course, I'm like, whatever, like, cool, why not? And then during harvest in 2018, it was like this insane harvest. And this man named Alain, he came by and he was retiring. He was planning his retirement and he had like eight hectares and he went to Fanfan and was like, listen, do you want to buy like the totality of the eight hectares? Or he's like, do you know someone? Like I'm starting to plan for my retirement. And uh, Fanfan was like, no, um, like I don't personally, but I was like literally just standing there. He's like, but Katie might. And I was like, yeah, I totally, like I do totally. And uh, but I told him I was like, I don't want to buy eight, like I I couldn't buy eight hectares. It's impossible. And I really my project was like I want something I could do by myself, mostly. And um, we're like, okay. So we went to see the different plots, and one of them was this. 
and I was like, oh my God, it's amazing because actually Jean-Francois, his, he has vines across the hillside on Bia and we used to be working there all the time and you can see it, like that's their view from working there. I was like, wow, that's such a nice parcel. There's like the cabane in the middle and like, wow, one day, like imagine if I could have something like that. And we got here, I was like, oh my God, this is it. This is the parcel. And um, so that was in 2018 and the Alain, he, was, I, he didn't want to like break up his parcels, but it ended up working out and the other neighbors bought the other parcels and so i just i worked on that project since 2018 and it's a huge amount like any agricultural sale or anything is really a lot of paperwork in france so um yeah and what happened is alain also um he was leasing a parcel in varon which is in rotelier and he's like, why don't you, because that's the only one he didn't own, he was still in lease. And he's like, why don't you take it? So that was in 2020, he's like, why don't you take it in 2020? So we like went to the owner and like, kind of like had to talk it out. And like, actually, Fanfa, like, because they don't know me at all, I'm just like, étranger uh, woman, from, like, they're like, who are you? And so Fanfa literally had to come with me and was like, no, she's cool, like, she'll, she'll do a good job, it's okay. So um, in 2020, I took over 60 hours of Chardonnay in Varon, and so that was the first uh, like real wine that I was making at my at my place. So, yeah, all, like just thanks to Alain, thanks to Fonfon, thanks to like I don't know, it all just kind of worked out. And so here we are. This is the Savignon, and it's like amazing. I think the terroir is amazing. It's all it's Marne with calcare and it's just like and it's different it really changes throughout the parcel but there's like different veins of marne and the calcare also like here it's really like white small rocks over there it's getting into like a darker darker rocks with different minerals oh my god he's so funny you want all the attention don't you buddy? <laughs> i'm just so beautiful this is technically part of the village is up the hill even though Groose is like right here i'm technically the next and it's like literally a huge like fillets of rock and I just imagine like over time, like that rock has come and like this would be uh, like underwater at some point, right? So it's just like the rock coming down. Yeah. What's your favorite Jura grape? Oh my goodness. Uh, Savignon. And why? I just, I mean, I don't have a favorite. They're all awesome, but I just think Savignon from like a growing perspective, except for that doesn't have like always the highest yields, but compared to like, it's kind of resistant to a lot of things. It's late, so it doesn't frost as much. It grows straight. It's just like kind of easy compared to other grapes, I find. And I just think it's so versatile. I mean, it has generally high acid, uh, like low pH. I think for natural winemaking, that's incredible. It makes it easier to work without sulfur. And it's so, yeah, it's so versatile in the sense you can make it uh, Ouye, you can make it souvoir, you can make a uh, vin de pie, you could make like a like you could make so much stuff with the same grape, and I just think that's amazing. But and I love Sauvignon, I love dr drinking Sauvignon, I love vin jaune, I love like. But I don't know the other. Like, I also love Chardonnay from Jura. I don't know. There's no can't have favorite children, you know. But um, yeah, I just I think Sauvignon, and I really like those are the kind of wines I really love. Like I love Chana, I love Riz like kind of high acid vibrant wines and that's uh, a personal taste I think more than more than anything else yeah this is the Sud Sud Revermont we are like deep south uh my friends in Arbois used to <laughs> joke they're like yeah you're in Jura Espanol because it's like <laughs> so far south you're basically in uh in Spain but um yeah this is south south Revermont but we're just kind of like back in the valley but um there's not you can go farther south, there's like two or three other uh, villages that you find wines in, but we're kind of like getting at the southern limit of Jura, yeah. before you turn into Bougie. I think it's cool that they're like, I feel all of a sudden there's like tons of young people that are like, everyone's like, do you know this new person? Do you know this new person in Jura? I'm like, I have no idea, but it's great that it seems like there's a lot of like young energy coming in that's amazing I mean I know what the future is for my project and the things that interest me but that's such a personal project I don't know and like I don't mean to I wouldn't put that on other people like I hope that other people want to farm regeneratively that look at soil that look at 
ecology and I feel that's sort of the way things are going. The things that interest me the most are like um, our ecology and like what a real like a, what, what could a truly sustain like can agriculture even be sustainable what would it look like if it was sustainable uh, I'm like fascinated I'm not a soil scientist but I'm fascinated by soil science right now and like that's all I want to learn about is like everything that's like the architecture of the soil if you will and building health of the soils and I think the capacity for like soil and as a carbon sink and like photosynthesis to take carbon from the air and put it into the the ground like it just feels like kind of a, a hopeful piece when it comes to climate change and that like wow I actually have some land and I could do something with it even if it's like you know it's only three hectares that's not you know it's not going to change the world but it feels a bit proactive and uh I don't know I would like I just love it I know it looks like to other people it looks like a bit wild but like I love coming here and there's like flowers and like the vines are kind of crazy and it's not because I haven't spent hours in the vines, it's just that I have a slightly, like the most important thing to me is, is soil health and I think everything else will follow after that as well. So it's a, pro I don't know, it's a, an experimental project uh, of, for my lifetime, you know, I don't even know if it's for me, maybe it'll be for the whoever takes over these vineyards, we'll see. What's it like being a young female winemaker in a very male dominated world? Oh, that's right. I had a conversation about this today. I mean, one, it's like, one hand, it's cool because I'm kind of, I'm not unique. There's tons of female winemakers, but I would say I'm unique that I'm like by myself in a vineyard project that I created. So that's quite unique. So that gives me maybe like a little bit of panache. I don't know. But then, I don't know. It's like, it's good and bad. So there's like tons of, like you feel a lot of patriarchy. But that's, I think, agriculture and small village life wherever you go or city, you know, for women everywhere. And that's, you know, and that's a different conversation, perhaps. Uh, and, and, you know, I don't come from an agricultural milieu. I come from the city. I don't come from here. So there's like lots of things that I think I'm always going to be like a bit of an outsider. But at the same time, I feel like super well, like anytime I need something, my neighbors are there for me, like Fon is there for me. Uh, I feel at the same time incredibly lucky to have all that I have here and I would never have done it by myself so there's like constant challenges but you know I had this like funny when I used to work in Canada on the tasting bar I just told this story today just like by chance but I would work with my colleague who was my age and I was actually the assistant winemaker but they would always ask him they're like oh is this your winery and then they would everyone would oh not everyone but a lot of people would ask me like oh are you the winemaker's wife or are you i'm just like no <laughs> but i'm like that's fine we'll taste anyways um so you know there's just like things like that that are a bit like it gets a bit tiring but i try not to focus on that stuff i think it'll always be there and uh there's so much amazing stuff about being a woman i also feel it gives me a bit of freedom because i don't have to do things like i don't come from uh a family so I miss a bit of that heritage but it also gives me freedom that I can kind of do I don't have to follow in somebody's footsteps either so I don't know there's good and bad I guess for both of those <laughs> yeah yeah, but that's life, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I can't complain. I have it pretty good, you know. Here's a little cabane. We're going to try to, I don't know, we're going to try to, maybe not this year, but do a little terrasse. We can do tastings here. I want to build like a wood fire oven. That's kind of a project for after harvest. If we get organized, and that would be amazing. We could have like pizza parties. The winemaking families, they had cows and they also had vines and it was like kind of it was like really a polyculture and there were a lot more vines like this whole forest at one point used to be poor Fluxera was all vines right it was like all planted so uh and I I think it's nice from like a uh, crop like you know different like a like I want to say polyculture but like from having different crops is that this is also in AOC Les Deux Comté so there's like but maybe actually that and like sometimes when they did the AOC like maybe that prairie under the vines is not AOC vines it could just be 
Conte. But that means that there's vines, but it's not only vines, there's like vines and there's cows and then there's a lot of fields for hay and grasses growing. So because in Lake Conte, they, they just, they grow all their own hay and everything. So um, it's, I think I love that because it makes it not just like, you don't feel like it's just like vines, 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 vines all the time. And it's, um, you know, there's other things going on. There's the forest, it's like a bit like, Sauvage, you know. So, but yeah, I don't know. You can you can ask him. <laughs> it was seventeen. The fifteens were still in barrel. Also, I had like not really tasted a lot of like a little bit of Ganva before I got there. But the fifteens were still in barrel, and they were so they were like none of them were dry. They were all like in mallow. They were like tasting them was like what is this? And um, like really, it was such a big year as well. So they were like kind of fat. I was like, wow, these are weird wines. Like not what I was expecting. And then just having this long elevage for the 15th, like gave them finesse and they were, they're so incredible now and like gave them a bit of energy and the inverts for the 16s, I thought that the 16s were such a cold vintage and like really extreme like laser acid and the three year elevage really gave them some sort of like softness and roundness. So I just, in the whites and Jura, it was just something I, I like still to this day I found it remarkable how that longer elevage changed the wines for the better in both cases so I also think like in terms of like Jura you're like we're gonna frost again we frost all the time like I would ra it, I think it's a smarter thing to have volume in the cellar so then when you have those years of frost you're not like totally freaking out about how you're going to recover financially and stuff so I think there's a lot of, of good things. And yeah, it's hard to, you know, like I obviously I want to sell the wines, but um, I just think they're great after, even like there's a there's a difference now, like we'll taste um, between the first release and the second release and, you know, aging is always, can al is always good, I think. Seems but like we'll see. Um, Like yeah. And uh, Emmanuel. Yep. Yeah. And um, what do you think about that kind of new generation coming through that have had such great experiences? With oh, uh, I mean, I can't speak for everyone else, but like, wow, I think we're super lucky. <laughs> I mean, uh, Alex and I were just talking the other day how we're, uh, you know, I hope that we can find our own style and our own voice in wine, that it's not all, and it's like a bit complicated when you see people are just selling your wines as someone that worked at Gamba like I understand because he is such an incredible huge person in the world of natural wine or like menu whatever but um so I think that we're like I only speak for myself like I hope that I have my own voice in my own wines and that's important to me and that people are drawn to them because of me and my story and like what I'm doing in the vines like that's also important to me but I like I, it was such a formative time there that I was like, it's incredible, right? So like, I like I knew how to make wine, but like really the f the finesse the finesse of making like the wine. I feel really confident to make the wines. Like I have the skills to make the wines that I want to drink, and that interest me. And I think that's the best because there's always people that will like different styles and whatever. But if I feel if I can make wines that I like and I feel good about and I feel like I have integrity, like that's great. And I. Feel I think my time at Ganva was like number one reason why I can do that and tasting all the time like he's so good like he's so generous with tasting and like my palate totally grew like just as a professional thing you know and it was just um I think we're really lucky to have <laughs> those teachers you know and that they are so generous and like there's so many of us that have now vines or you know like I think of like Nico and Alex that we have he, he's been so helpful for us you know like we've obviously worked really hard it's not the only piece but um yeah i just think we're lucky i guess i don't know <laughs> anywho so i don't have a lot of things to taste i just racked the whites it's a bit cloudy i just racked them yesterday afternoon so it will settle so this was the 2020 les verrons um that was in barrel for two years And so everything so far has been like a it's a whole cluster press in the click clack press and that was there in the cab already it was totally 
like not disgusting, but the it was black and the the cage was all rotten. And I was looking for a press in 2020. I was like, it's kind of a shame that it's like such a beautiful old. It's like a, I don't know, it's like almost 200 years old um, to have that in the calf. So uh, we took up. I took apart the cage and redid the metal. And then a friend of mine, we rebuilt. Well, he rebuilt it mostly, but we rebuilt the cage. And it's great. And so everything's been pressed in there so far. And the whites, like all the winemaking is pretty simple for me. It's uh, the whites are, their whole cluster pressed in there. I don't have any chilling at the moment. So it's uh, one night debrobage in a cube. And then they were all racked by gravity in 2020 into barrel and ferment in barrel. And then they were just assembled um, yesterday. And we'll hopefully bottle, um, bottle before harvest.